So today let's make some further experiments and measurements in my induction cooker plate or its internals, which were donated by Marcel from Germany. So once again, thanks for the donation and... Today I especially wanted to do some measurements of the current waveform in the coil and also the phase shift between the voltage and the current. And of course this requires a two-channel oscilloscope, but because my two-channel oscilloscope is grounded, I have to use a current sensing transformer to isolate it from mains, because those coils are not isolated from mains. And also because the currents are probably quite high, it's better to use a current sensing transformer instead of just a resistor in a series, a current sensing shunt. I can measure the voltage on the coil with isolation by probably just putting a loop of wire on it and this gives me the voltage waveform on it. Not having to connect my oscilloscope straight to mains and the current is going to be sensed using a current sensing transformer. Let's try to make a current sensing transformer on a ferrite ring from one turn to 100 turns and the loading resistor will be probably one ohm and let's also give it some over voltage protection. The voltage is going to be clamped by those two pairs of anti-parallel diodes should some horrible disaster happen. And the pair of diode is going to start passing a current at about 1 volt in total and at a very high current it will drop about 2.5 volts. So the diodes shouldn't actually have any effect up to about 1 volt, let's say, and, and the current is the voltage divided by the resistance and this is 1 volt divided by 1 ohm and this is 1 amp. So this can actually go up to 1 amp and it's 1 to 100 ratio, so it's going to go up to 100 amps on this side. And it's going to be 1 volt per 100 amps, which means 10 millivolts per 1 amp. And I was trying to guess what waveforms to expect and it's probably going to be something like this. Here's the current through the circuit the voltage of the capacitor bank, the half bridge output voltage and those gate voltages for the transistors. The half bridge output is basically a square wave with slow rise and fall because of the snubber capacitors and it's a series resonant circuit running above its resonance so it's actually acting inductive and so the current should be lagging after the voltage of the half bridge. And of course the current goes through the capacitor bank and if the voltage on it is a sine wave then the current should be also a sine wave but 90 degree leading before the voltage waveform. Even though of course in reality it's going to be a bit distorted because it's not driven by a sine wave from the half bridge. It's more like a square wave. And for example when the upper transistor turns off the voltage on the half bridge falls from the positive rail to the negative rail and then the lower transistor should turn on. But of course in this picture the transistor is turning on at the last moment during the zero crossing. It should probably happen a bit earlier. Probably somewhere here. It still has to happen after the voltage falls to zero, so the transistor is turning under a zero voltage. But it should be before the zero crossing, because if it didn't turn on after the zero crossing, the voltage would try to go back up, and then the transistor would have to pull it down. And this is probably something that would also happen if the half bridge tried to run it below the resonant frequency. The resonant circuit would always make one full cycle and a bit of the next cycle and it would probably look like this. But of course this would be lossy, it would be no longer a zero voltage switching. It's really quite a black magic, it's not easy to imagine what's happening in the circuit but for an efficient operation it has to run above its resonance and during the transition one transistor turns off then there is the dead time and then the other one turns on. And this all has to happen before the zero crossing of the current. Which of course means that it has to run above its resonant frequency. It has to happen before the resonant circuit finishes a full cycle. And then the current is still in the right direction, so it actually helps the voltage at the output of the half bridge to transition instead of working against it. Because after the zero crossing, the current is actually working against the transistors. 
For a zero voltage switching, both transistors have to change their state before the zero crossing of the current. I think if the zero crossing of the current happened during the dead time, which actually means that it runs very close to its resonant frequency, the voltage at the output of the half bridge would probably look something like this. Basically the upper transistor turns off, the current still pulls it down, then it goes through the zero crossing and it throws it up, and then the lower transistor turns on and pulls it down. I think I have seen this in my Tesla coil, my solid state Tesla coil. This is the voltage at the output of the half bridge when it's running very close to its resonant frequency and it has a long dead time. And if it's running below the resonant frequency it's again a square wave but the current is actually not helping it transition. The transitions have to be forced by the transistors. And so it's more lossy. The transistors are turning on and off under the current. Or actually, below the resonance the transistors are turning off with no current, but they are turning on under a current and under the full voltage. And so it's quite a lossy turn on. Especially when the transistor also has to dissipate the energy in the snubber capacitor. Basically, below resonance, when one transistor turns off, nothing is happening because the current is going through its internal diode, not through the transistor. So it turns off with no current and the voltage doesn't want to go up on it. And the transition of the output voltage of the half bridge happens when the other transistor turns on. Of course under full voltage, under a current and with a lot of losses. On the other hand, above resonance, the transition of the voltage at the output happens when the first transistor turns off. The voltage transitions and then the transistor turning on turns on with no losses and basically with no voltage on it and no current through it. So those are my random thoughts about why it's driven above resonance, why it's better and how much does it differ from running it below resonance. And of course to reduce the power, it increases the frequency even farther above resonance. And of course now it's getting bloody confusing and complicated, so instead of talking, let's build a current sensing transformer and let's show some waveforms. Starting to make a current sensing transformer on a freight train, which used to be an interference filter, similar to this one. So that's my current sensing transformer, 100 turns on the secondary. I gave it wire terminals and I put some Kepton tape over it, which made it look completely rubbish, but at least it's safer. And here's the current sensing transformer on it, secured with some zip ties and I put some extra Kepton tape over all those wires for more isolation. And it's better to put it on the capacitor side, where there is just a sine wave, instead of on the half bridge side where there are sudden transients. On the capacitor side, less interference is coupled into it through the stray capacitance. So let's measure the coil current using the current sensing transformer. Now it's set to four and a half and here is the current sensing resistor and the protective diodes and the probe going to my oscilloscope. And at a slow scan rate you can see the envelope of the signal, which is basically the amplitude of it modulated by the main ripple. This is one main half cycle, one millisecond per division. And here you can see it two milliseconds per division zoomed out and at five milliseconds per division. But now let's actually keep zooming it in to see the high frequency oscillations instead of the envelope. Still zooming in and that's the high frequency. Changing the trigger level actually makes it show either all the waveforms from a very low amplitude to the highest one or just the highest one near the peak of the main half cycle. Can you see that? It looks quite interesting. 
Now you can see all the amplitudes of it at various stages of the main cycle and now it's just near the peak of the main half cycle or basically when the main is going through about 325 volts. So that's the current in the coil and it's 5 millivolts per division but with the probe times 10 it's 50 millivolts per division. And 10 millivolts is 1 amp, so it should be 5 amps per division. And the amplitude seems to be about 2 and a half divisions, so it's about 12 and a half amps peak now. And this is the power level 4 and a half. Now let's try 9. Let's actually reduce the sensitivity before this. Now it's 5 microseconds per division and 20 amps per division. And increasing the power from 4.5 to 9 gradually. And the frequency goes down and the current goes up. 5.5, 6, 6.5, 7, 7.5, 8, 8.5 and, and 9. And again I can change the threshold of the trigger. You can either see the maximum amplitude or all the amplitude during the main cycle. Now it's 20 amps per division and it's about two and a half divisions. So it's about 50 amps peak going through the coil. And let's turn it down. Of course, very low levels are cycling. Power levels below 4 are basically cycling on and off. Now let's try to take the pot away from the coil slowly. And it shuts down and let's put it back. And it gradually goes up. Putting it away. And back to the coil. And once more, away from the coil. And with nothing on the coil, it's just pulsing and testing it. It seems to be like a triangle wave or a sawtooth. It's trying to detect a pot using a sawtooth. Well, it's basically a square wave connected to the coil and by the inductance, the waveform is integrated into a sawtooth or a triangle wave. Now it's basically not resistive, just purely inductive and also the amplitude is so small that there is virtually no voltage on the capacitors and so they don't have any effect, just that the coil has some effect. And now it turned off completely because it wasn't detecting anything. And the testing signal is about 70 or 80 kilohertz. Now let's try to also sense the voltage on the coil. It's actually possible using just a loop near the coil. And of course the polarity of those waveforms in reference to each other depends on the polarity of the voltage sensing loop and the current sensing transformer in reference to each other. If I flip the voltage sensing loop, the polarity of the voltage changes, of course. I flipped it so it doesn't look like the coil is generating power, because it's actually drawing power. The majority of the current positive half cycle is overlapping with the positive half cycle of the voltage. You can see that it's not exactly in phase, which means that it's not purely resistive, but it's also not shifted by 90 degree, which means that it's not purely capacitive or inductive. Majority of the positive half cycle is overlapping with the positive half cycle and the majority of the negative half cycle is overlapping with the negative half cycle. So it's drawing partially a real power and partially it's reactive. When you take a look at the current waveform, it looks a little bit like a sine wave but it's broken in two points, here and here. It's actually broken where the half bridge switches the voltage, here and here. When you take a closer look at the current waveform, it looks kind of like a sine wave but with some bits missing. The curve is broken after every half cycle. 
And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. It's running above its resonant frequency, so the half bridge switches the polarity before it manages to make one full half cycle. Looking at the current waveform, it looks like the end of each half cycle is missing, it's cut out. The last quarter or the last third of each half cycle is missing. And basically here we have a sine wave and let's try to cut out one quarter at the end of this half cycle and let's continue with the other half cycle. And let's also cut out the last quarter of the negative half cycle and let's continue with the next half cycle and it kind of looks like what you can see on the oscilloscope. Maybe even more than one quarter cut out, like one third. It's definitely less than one half because it goes over its top. It's basically a sine wave with roughly the last third missing out of each half cycle. And this is what happens when you drive it above its resonance. And this also shrinks the amplitude of it, so running it above resonance limits the power. So this is probably the simplest explanation why does the current waveform look like this. And this is at its full power. When it's running at a low power, it runs it even more above resonance, so it shrinks even more probably and it will basically look more like a sawtooth or a triangle wave. And this is power level four and a half. And the voltage on the coil is very similar to a square wave. And the current waveform is similar to a sawtooth or a triangle wave. And it's running significantly above resonance, which means that the resonant circuit is mostly inductive and the capacitive component is almost negligible. And the capacitor bank in series with the coil has almost no voltage on it, or almost no high frequency voltage. The capacitor bank is working now as just a voltage divider. And because it's not resonating with the capacitors, the coil is mostly getting the voltage from the half bridge. It's very close to a square wave and the inductance is integrating the square wave into a triangle wave. And the current waveform is actually not far from what my paper waveform simulator shows. Now let's try to lift the pot a little bit. And it's actually reducing the frequency and increasing the power and the amplitude to compensate for the poor coupling. Lifting it once more, it shuts down. Now let's try lifting the pot at the full power. And it again reduces the frequency to compensate for the poor coupling. And also the voltage waveform is changing. And the maximum distance for it to still run is three tiles stacked on each other between the coil and the pot. And of course it delivers way less power in this condition. It's the highest power setting, nine. But it only draws 3.2 amps from mains. With just one tile it draws 7.6 amps from mains. And here's the comparison between the waveforms when the pot is closer to the coil versus farther from the coil. When it's farther it's working less efficiently and it delivers less power. And the resonant circuit is more reactive, less resistive. And you can also kind of see that when the pot is farther, the waveforms are more out of sync, which also indicates less real power and more reactive power. And somebody in the comments said it's a pulse with modulation of power. No, it's not. It's not a pulse with modulation, it's a frequency modulation. Well, it's actually reducing the length of the pulse to reduce the power, but it's not increasing the dead time. It can't make the dead time longer because the next transistor has to turn on before the zero crossing of the current. Because otherwise the voltage would go up on it and it would be no longer a zero voltage switching. The transistor has to turn on before the current actually brings the voltage up on it. And there is one oddity. There is just one blower and it's connected to this board and when I'm using this board, the 24 volt power supply has to turn on on this board, connected to mains via this relay and the boards have to communicate through the bus. 
And the board has seemed to be connected via this bus. There is a ground connection, 5 volt connection, some single wire bus and some standby signal. And of course the ground is not a main ground, it's the common zero volt rail of it. And this is an interesting device, but it's annoying that it's not compatible with all pots. It doesn't work with aluminium pots, probably because they are too conductive and they also probably have to have some magnetic properties. But the most annoying part of it is probably those touch buttons, which are failing and they were probably quite annoying to use even when it was new. And even more annoying is this knob, because you choose some coil and you turn it then, and you accidentally choose other coils and change the power of other coils. Choose this one, and now I accidentally turn this one up. Now this one up and I want to turn this one up. That's annoying. I want to turn this one off, this one off. I wanted this one to turn down, but I'm turning this one. Instead of turning it, I just accidentally tap some of the coils. Before you manage to turn one coil all the way to nine, you accidentally power the other three coils. I would definitely prefer to have one knob for each coil. And how do you turn it during cooking with your wet fingers or slightly greasy fingers from oil or butter? I'm really not sure. But anyway, this video is getting bloody long as always. This is Dragon Wild and see you in my next videos and thanks to all of my patronos on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And of course you can also become my patron to support my channel and get early videos. In the description there is a link to my Patreon and also to my Instagram. And of course I still plan another episode of those dodgy chargers.